Grade twos, threes, fours, fives, um, welcome to our service. Welcome to, to big church, you might call it. Uh, could you do me a favor? If you're in grade two, three, four, or five, could you stand up? Would you be brave enough to stand up with me? Okay, we got a few here. Okay. Um, I just want you to okay, hear what Pastor Andrew says here, okay? Um, you are so important to our church family. Did you know that? Everyone here in this room, we think you are so special, and we don't think we just kind of send the children downstairs for church time because children have to be downstairs. No, we want you to get to hear about Jesus. We want you to know how much God loves you. That's why he sent Jesus, and we believe you are the church, okay? And so our young people, our children, our uh, not-so-young people, um, we're all part of the church, and we get to be one big family. Now, now let me, uh, is there anyone here who, who would join me on stage and help me out? Um, now, before you volunteer, maybe make sure mom and dad are okay with you being on the camera, okay? Um, but would anybody join me up here? Do you have any hands, any volunteers? Okay, we're a little nervous. Oh, right here, is that Dolly? Dolly, come on up. Okay. Whew. Everyone, this is Dolly, huh? Um, Dahlia, uh, I, I have here, um, actually, I think you recognize this rock, don't you? This rock is actually from Dolly's house, so she's familiar with, <laughs> with this rock. And we had a, your dad and a whole bunch of our, our strongest guys here at Calvary. It took, I won't say how many it took, but it took a few of us to get this thing on stage. And then um, my, my daughters, they, they love going to the sand and, and building sandcastles. And I thought, I can join them. I can build a sandcastle. And this is as far as I got. So that's my sandcastle. Um, now, Dolly, uh, tell me something. If When they're doing, you, they're about to do the construction, right? It's about to get messy in here. So I thought, let's have a little mess. Um, Henry, Mary, Heather, I'm sorry. I'll clean this part of the mess up, okay? Um, but if they, Dolly, if they took the roof off, for example, and it was just wide open, and all of a sudden a storm started, and it's raining and the wind's blowing, which of these two fine... Um, buildings do you think would last longer? You think you're Rockwood, hey? You don't think it's my sandcastle? Are you sure? Should we test this out? Okay. Here we go, Dolly. Um, I heard Henry looking for his pail this morning. Sorry, Henry. It was me. Now, Dolly, this is um, pretty heavy. Do you want to... I want you to dump this on the rock, and we're going to see if we can move this rock, Okay. Would you see if it's too heavy, and maybe I can help you if it is. All right, you go ahead. Give it a pour. Well done. Mom and Dad, sorry for the shoes. Okay. Now, did anybody see the rock move? No? Okay. Um, should we try it with the sand? Oh, yeah. That's the whole reason you're here. All right. Bucket number two. You want? Hey, now, you just watch the front row here. Okay, these are our guests. Um, they came all the way from Iraq to be here today, okay? We don't want to soak them, all right? You go ahead. You got that one? It's pretty heavy. Oh, yeah! Wow! Oh, my goodness. Hey, that wasn't so bad. Yeah, you can get... Wow, that is... Um, that's a mess we made. Dolly, high five. You are a champion. Um, you can go back to your seat. Can you give her a round? Thank you. Well, Hob and family, just, you know, just in case it gets too close to you, okay? There you go. Um, you, you take that. It's clean, I promise. And uh, you know what? Just so nobody gets hurt here, why don't I just uh, put that right there, okay? Just in case you didn't notice the mess. Wow, that was fun. I didn't really know how it would go. I think we proved our point. We are winding down our Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon in human history. And at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, given by Jesus, the Son of God himself, he ends it with probably the most famous analogy or illustration um, ever given. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. If you, I hear pages turning. If you have your Bible with you, you turn to Matthew 7. If you don't, that's okay. It's going to be up on the screen behind me. My, behind me. Uh, but if you don't have a Bible, I would love you to have a Bible because each and every week we take this and we read it and we don't just think it's some ancient book made up by humans. No, we, we really do believe this is God's word to us. 
and he has something to say to, to our lives too about the people of the past, but it speaks to the people of today. And so in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus, he's, through chapter 5 through 7, he's been giving us this sermon, these rules for his community, how, how he wants his followers to interact with each other and to, to interact with the world around us. And at the end of that sermon, he gives us this object lesson. He's, remember, he's up on a mountainside, so maybe he's looking around, and he, he sees all of these rocks, and he gives us... You, you've probably heard this one. Even if today you're kind of new to church, and, and welcome, by the way, or it's been a long time, you don't really know the Bible, you've probably heard this one. Matthew 7, verse 24. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rains came, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man or woman. The rains came, The floods rose, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. See, it's one thing to to pour some water, a little bit of water here on on a rock and and on a wimpy sandcastle, Um, but, but if we zoom out for a second, Jesus is giving us a small picture of our lives. Let me ask you. What is your life built on? What is the rock in your life, your foundation, the thing you rely on to to hold you during the storms and to carry you on the peaks? What What is your life built on? Jesus' illustration here about a rock and sand, it it comes on on the heels of, of him talking about two paths. He says there are two paths in life. One is is narrow, and one is wide. There's two kinds of people, two kinds of followers, those who are all in with Jesus and those who are all out, he says, by the end of it. There's two ways that we can build our lives, a wise one and a foolish one. And despite what people may say around us, there's really only two choices. We, we either uh, have the choice that leads to life in God or the choice that, that leads to consequences, that leads to destruction, as Jesus would say it. And I know that sounds intense if you're thinking, man, this guy's a, he went from pouring water on a sand pile to uh, getting super intense on me. Well, if, if that's how you're feeling right now, then you understand the weight of what Jesus is saying, because he's, he's not kidding around. Um, there are consequences for our choices in life, and, and they're eternal, eternal life or eternal punishment. And, and li- listen, I don't say that to, to scare you. I say that because I truly, sincerely care about you. And I want you to know God cares about you. God God didn't uh, create us and and design this whole world because he wants to punish us. No, he created hell. He created hell for Satan and his army who who rebelled against him. He doesn't want us to go to hell. The whole reason he sent his son, Jesus Christ, the son of God, is, is to bring us life, to pave the path toward God and relationship with him. And Jesus, he says, I, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one comes to God except through me. Uh, So last week, I I shared with our church probably the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3.16. What we don't often quote after John 3.16 is is the next couple of verses. So so if you're not familiar with John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish. We're not going to go the way of that sand pile. No will have eternal life. But then look what the next verse says. John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. God wasn't looking to punish us, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. 
This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. C.S. Lewis, uh, he's the guy who wrote Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, C.S. Lewis uh, once said there are two kinds of people. Those who in the end um, say to God, thy will be done. And those who eventually God says to them in the end, okay, thy will be done. You can have it your way. And, and, and and maybe you're thinking at this point, okay, if, if you're telling me that, that the consequences are huge, the stakes are high, this is, this is light, this is dark, this is life, this is death, well, I choose life. I choose God's grace. How, what, how do I build my life on Jesus? I, give me that answer, Andrew. Get on with it, boy. Okay, how do, I, how do I build my life on Jesus? Well, how do I build my life on this rock? You trust. Trust. You got to start with, with a firm foundation, one that's not going to move. Start by trusting Jesus. Start by trusting Jesus. And to trust Jesus is to say that, that no amount of goodness in me. Like we've all met good people, someone who's kind, someone who does the right thing. No amount of, of goodness in us will make us good enough for God. No matter how much we aim for the stars, we're always going to fall short. Because our, our righteousness compared to the perfection of God and, and the holiness of God, it's, it's kind of like filthiness. It's, it's, it's not good. But Jesus did perfectly please God. Jesus never sinned. Flawless. And then he died on a cross to pay for my sin, to pay for your sin, to pay for our sin. And so we, we just trust his good work on our behalf. We trust Jesus. That's where we start. Peter, uh, one of Jesus' closest followers, um, if you, if you read through the Gospels, you hear some of Peter's story, and it's, thank God for Peter. He helps me to understand my life. Um, Peter says it this way when he writes a letter to the church. As you come to him, the living stone, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. For in Scripture, it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, in, in Jerusalem, where, where Jesus did all this, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. When we trust Jesus, we'll never be put to shame. Paul calls Jesus the chief cornerstone. We, the church, are, are, are like this spiritual building being put together and held together by, by God's Holy Spirit living in us. And so we start by trusting Jesus, but, but we don't just begin trusting Jesus and then sort of move on uh, to other things as, as if now we get to the big guy or the big girl stuff. As if uh, when we get to a deeper level of spirituality, we, don't, we leave the fundamentals behind. No, I don't need that anymore. No, no, no. We start by trusting Jesus, and then we keep trusting Jesus. That's how you build your life on the rock. You, you keep on trusting Jesus. You continue to build your life in him. Um, could you imagine if, if the builders, you see the foundation out there, um, they, they start building a foundation, and then when they keep going with the project, they just move away from the foundation, and they start right here and built the house with no foundation. Imagine how weak and, and flimsy that house would be. Well, that's, that's a little bit how we sometimes treat our relationship with Jesus. We, we say, thank you for the foundation. Thank you for saving me, but, but I'll build from here. I've got it, Jesus. I know your number. I'll, I will call you if I need you, okay? You just stay over here. But, but that's not how we lay a foundation. A foundation of fil- faith, we, we start trusting, but then we, we keep trusting. We grow. In, in Colossians chapter 2, Paul says, So then, just as you receive Christ, Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Two things Paul is, is implying with those verses is one, Jesus followers, we, uh, sometimes called disciples, will we'll make other disciples. You see how right there it, Paul said, as you were taught, continue to be strengthened in Jesus as you were taught. We, we should be teaching each other what it looks like and how we follow Jesus together. But then the second thing Paul says is, is that we'll prioritize our relationship with Jesus above everything else. See, we got to spend time with, with Jesus. Um, married people in the room, those of us who have, have close friends, uh, you know what this is like. If, if someone tells you all the time, I love you, I love you, I love you, sweetie, I love you, snookum, whatever, whatever your thing is, okay? <laughs> 
That's great that you're telling me you love me. I need that. Thank you for that. But, what, like, but then what if they're never in the house, right? I love you, but I'm never around. Or what about friends? Do you have the friend who every time you bump into each other at, at the grocery store or something, oh, we really need to get together. We, we should be spending some time together. But then you never actually book it, right? Maybe that says something about our friendship. Maybe we're not as close as I thought we were. And, and it's similar with, with Jesus. We need to spend time with him. If we want to get to know him, read his word. So, for example, if, if you're just starting to learn about Jesus, or if you have learned about him for 50 years, take, take the Gospels. By the way, the Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. That's the four books that start the New Testament. Those are the stories about Jesus' life here on earth. Well, take one of those, and, and for a month, just read through the story, as if you're one of the disciples, you're one of Jesus' followers, learning how to follow him. So you can start that way, read his word, or, or pray to him. In this Sermon on the Mount, in, in Matthew 6, verse 9 through 13, as well as Matthew 7, verse 7 through 11, Jesus teaches us how to pray. And so, so we just start, let's have a conversation with him and get to know him. Um, we memorize his teaching. So take, take the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, and just, just learn it. That's gold for our lives. But Jesus has much more ter- teaching, right? Because he's God, this whole word is his. And so we learn what he says, but a wise person builds their life in Jesus on his truth, his teaching. They trust, they grow. But if our relationship with Jesus never extends beyond what what I sometimes call our quiet time, our reading the Bible and our prayer, if if we never get out of our own head and heart and and kind of into the world and and do life with other people, then, then we sort of miss the point Jesus is saying. Because did you see it right there in his analogy in Matthew 7? He says, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise person. See, we don't just hear what Jesus says. We don't just agree with it. Oh, that's oh, good stuff, Jesus. No, we go and we live it. How do I build my life on, on the rock, on Jesus? Well, we obey. We do what Jesus says. Or as James, his follower, says, don't just listen to God's word. Do what it says. He goes on, James chapter 2, he says, faith, trust, without works, is dead. It's not really faith. So, so we trust, we, we obey, we listen to everything Jesus says, um, the things we like, like, oh, that's really good teaching, and the things that are hard to hear. Even when it kind of gives us this jerk reaction of, oh, I don't want to do that. That's hard. We've got to listen then to um, knowledge. You maybe heard this before. Knowledge is knowing the right thing to do. But wisdom, the wise builder, knows what is the right thing to do and actually does it. We do what we know to be right. And maybe you're thinking at this point, okay, obey. We've got to trust, but we've also got to obey. Are you telling me that, that God saves us based on our obedience? No. See, God knew we could never perfectly obey him. And that's why he sent his perfect son in our place to to give us, um, to to take our place, the punishment our sin deserves, so we don't have to face hell. No, we can have life forever. We can have relationship with God. We can have forgiveness. We can have meaning. We can figure out our purpose in life. Jesus offers us all of this. And here's what he says in John chapter 6. This is the only work God wants from you to believe in the one he has sent. Believe in Jesus. All those who who believe in the Lord Jesus will be saved. That's a promise. But what Jesus is trying to tell us by this analogy is that if we trust him, if we build our lives on him and in him, if we make him the foundation or the cornerstone, then, then, then we're gonna obey. It's as if he's, he's the hub of the wheel and every spoke of our lives is connected to him. He's connected to everything. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. This is what it means to build our lives on the rock. But so often, we build our life on sinking sand. So um, we put a 200-pound rock on the stage. I got to use it a little bit more. I got, some other, uh, I got some other things here. So often, we, we take something that's, that's kind of neutral. It could be a good thing. Um, 
Maybe this is your, your career, your work. Or, or maybe it's the education that you've always dreamed of. And we say, okay, that's a good foundation. Or, or maybe for you, it's, it's a relationship. And, and this, is, this is everything we live for. I need that relationship. Or, or maybe it's our family and our dreams of what family means and everything it'll be. So far, our life's working out okay, hey? We're building a tower. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's our stuff. Maybe it's our comfort. And eventually, we just keep building. Maybe it's traveling. Maybe it's seeing the world. Oh, and if we keep building and building on the wrong foundation, eventually it's all going to come crashing. And we're going to get to the end of our lives. And we're going to realize, what are we left with? Maybe some money. But possibly a whole lot of broken relationships. And not a lot of love. See, did you notice that both houses in this story that, that Jesus talks about, both houses have storms. The house on the rock as well as the, the house built on the sand. What Jesus is trying to help us see is that, that rainy days are going to come. Storms come in our lives. That's, that's a guarantee. Jesus wants us to realize that. But they, they say you, you should plan for a rainy day, Right? Oh, just in case, for a rainy day plan. Well, Jesus, a relationship with Jesus is, is your best storm plan. It's your best planning for a rainy day. And, and here at Calvary, you may or may not be aware, but it just it feels like the storms have, have been coming lately. And we've got some people in our church family who are really hurting. The disciples had, had this experience, right? The very next chapter of Matthew, they, Jesus sends them off into a boat, and, and a storm comes, and what is Jesus doing? Well, he's sleeping peacefully like a baby, right? And they say, Lord, we're drowning! Save us! And Jesus <sighs> calms the storm. And for some of us in the room, and maybe you're watching this online right now because you just couldn't bring yourself to come to church today, for some of us, that is our prayer right now. Lord, I feel like I'm drowning. Would you save me? I need you. And Jesus might not always calm the storm. Sometimes what he asks of us is, is, is to hold on tightly to the rock during the storm. But here's his promise. He promises the whole entire way He's going to be with you in the boat. He's not going to leave you. He won't abandon us. That's our rock. That's our hope. The rain came down. The streams rose. The winds blew and beat against the house. Yet, it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. And so where do we start with all this? This whole building our life on the rock, well, well, grade twos and fives, you, it's been like pin drop silent in here. So I don't know if people are sleeping or if you guys are just, you're, you're doing so well. But I've showed our adults this, but the first thing we need to do, how do we start with building our life on the rock? Well, we, we prioritize our relationship with Jesus. Um, forgive me for this analogy, but if, if this is Jesus, at least he's big, right? Um, we start building here. This is the foundation. And then you take things, again, it's not bad to have a career. In fact, Jesus wants us to provide for our family, but put it on the rock. Um, someday you, you would like to get a good education. That's, I'm sure your parents would love that. Put it on the rock, right? Do um, you, you need a house? Okay, you're, you're allowed to have a house. Put it on the rock. Friends, relationships, yep, rock. Right? Just everything we built here. There's a nice little crevice right there. And uh, I found some really pretty stones at home. Wanted to make sure I could get those on the rock. Okay. We just build our life on the rock. And, and, and if something doesn't quite fit, well, I'm going to hurt somebody. <laughs> maybe. Maybe it wasn't meant to be. Maybe, maybe it's not actually as important as we thought it was, right? But we start by building on the rock with the firm foundation. That's what Jesus wants us to get. 
prioritize the big... Thank you. <laughs> Jesus says there, there's two houses, and, and from the outside, if you were to look at both of these houses after they're built, they, they look objectively the same. But one stands and one falls. And the difference is the foundation. Jesus is the difference. And here's my fear as, as we wind this down, is that some of us, we believe correctly about Jesus without personally knowing him. Some of us, we, um, we, do, we do church when we can. We, we come to this place, but, but we've never actually taken the step to build our lives on Jesus and in Jesus. We've just sort of gone with the flow. And, and maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, isn't, isn't this a bit presumptuous of Jesus? Well, not really. I don't think so. This is, remember, we're talking about the Son of God. Like, he had all glory. He had perfection. He, he didn't need to lift a finger if he didn't want to. And yet he comes down to earth because he wants a relationship with us. Because he doesn't want us to be in despair or go to destruction. He, he came to us, right? And he doesn't just come as, like, king of the universe running the world. No, he comes as a humble servant into a poor family. And then he serves to the point of laying his life down as a sacrifice for our sin giving his life for us so that we can have a relationship with God, so that we can know him and know forgiveness and know eternal life. This, this is the God we serve. This is the king we serve. I think he has earned the right to ask for our lives. And so we call him Lord or master or ruler. We, we obey him. We listen to him. Matthew finishes this sermon on the mount, this whole section of Matthew chapter 5 through 7, saying that, that the crowds... After they heard all Jesus' teaching, they were left amazed at his teaching. It was like a mic drop moment because he taught as one who had authority, not as their teachers of the law. And then when we flip to the, to the end of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, this is, this is some of Jesus' last words to his followers, verse 18 through 20. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, Go. And make disciples of all nations, all the world, local, national, global. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And, and at the risk of stretching this metaphor just a little too far, but again, we, we got the rock here, okay? See, Jesus didn't just want us to to build up our lives onto like some high and desolate remote place and then be, be away from the world, right? Build our little tower and then keep other people away because then I can't hurt anybody and then I can't displease God and then I'll be perfect, right? No, he wanted us, and I'm not going to demonstrate here, but he wanted us to pick up our rock and take it with us, okay? He wanted us to go to take Jesus with us everywhere we went. Remember at the start of the Sermon on the Mount? You're the salt of the earth. You're the, the life preservative. You're what's going to, like when people are in that moment of despair and they say, how do you even have any hope? How, how do you do it? Well, because, because of the rock. Have I, can I tell you about my rock? You're the light of the world. You, you are the, the brightness and the path and, and the guiding thing that is pointing people toward God. And so this morning, it's Anniversary Sunday, and we have a chance to celebrate um, one young woman in our church, Jillian Crimson, who, who has, in her going, as Jesus says, in your going, make disciples. Um, Jill, in her going, has realized, I, Jesus is my rock. I've built my life on him, and I want to tell our church family. I want to, I want to tell the world. And so in just a moment, uh, she's going to get baptized here, and we have the privilege as a church family to celebrate in that and to obey Jesus' call in our lives to make disciples and to baptize people. And so we're going to do just that. But I want to ask you, have you answered Jesus' call in your life? Have you trusted him? Have you built your life on the rock? Have you been baptized and, and publicly declared it to the church family, to the world, to the friends around you? I'm, I'm with Jesus. What's stopping you? 
I'd love to talk to you more about that or any questions you have today. Uh, I, know, I know Dylan, as you saw him walking around, um, Nate, our other staff, they would, it would be a privilege to talk to you about this. But, but right now, would you turn your attention to the screen? We're going to listen to Jill's story. Hi, my name's Jillian. I grew up in a Christian family. I went to a Christian school from JK all the way up to grade 12. I'm really grateful for that because that's been a solid foundation for my faith. When I was in high school, we would, you know, have devotions every morning. We would pray in every class. There would be weekly chapels. I really got my daily dose of Jesus, but I really didn't have to do anything myself. I just had to show up. And so when I graduated high school and I started at Brock, things were a lot different because we wouldn't do devotions in my morning classes and we wouldn't pray before lunch. I didn't change the way that I was living. I was still going to church on Sundays, but I wasn't getting that daily dose of Jesus from school like I was used to. So during this time when I was at Brock, I was not relying on God. I was definitely just relying on my own strength. And so because of that, I was constantly stressed and burnt out all the time. I would stress over school. I would stress over my relationships, just everything. I was like a ball of stress, terrible. It was awful. I didn't really see the value of God in my life because I can pray and I can read my Bible, but God's not gonna write this essay that I'm stressing out over right now. Around this time, I would also see other Christians at church and online who just seemed like they had everything together, just seemed so in love with God, and they understood everything. Seeing them made me feel worse about myself because I felt like I didn't get it, didn't feel God's presence in my life, so what was I doing wrong? It made me feel like angry at myself and I felt like a bad Christian. I knew that God was real and I knew that if you believe Jesus died for your sins that you should get baptized, but I kind of felt like he was somebody else's God that I was watching from a distance. He wasn't a personal God to me. I felt like if I got baptized that I would almost be like a fraud because I wasn't feeling God's presence in my life. So I kept telling myself, you know, once I get into a better habit of praying or reading my Bible, then I'll get baptized. I tried to get into that better habit over and over again. Of course, I would always eventually fail and I would just like stop. And whenever I would stop, I would feel so so much worse about myself, like I would be so hard on myself. I was relying on my own strength. I was trying to be a better Christian without God's help, which doesn't, doesn't really work. <laughs> it got to a point where I was just really tired of trying to do things on my own. I prayed and I was like, God, help me get it. Help me understand, because I don't, I don't get it. It wasn't one life-changing moment where all of a sudden I knew, oh my goodness, my life is completely different. It happened over time where I started to notice God was changing my heart. I was a lot more aware of the ways that God was moving in my life. He sent these great friends into my life that have really challenged and encouraged me in my faith. I have stopped defining myself by how well I do in school or by my relationships, and I'm feeling a lot less stressed than I was before. I'm not always a big ball of stress anymore. <laughs> I have this peace that I know only really comes from God. It wasn't easy, and I'm definitely not a perfect Christian. I don't really think that it was even exist. I am still learning to lean on God every day and really just give up control to Him. I have seen the goodness of God in my life. It's been great. <laughs> One verse that's really stuck with me is Proverbs 20 verses 24. It says, the Lord directs her steps, so why try to understand everything along the way? And to me, it's kind of just a reminder, chill out, God's got you. You don't have to understand everything. You don't have to have everything under control because God does. My name's Nate, and uh, hi, Chelsea. And uh, as the kids have pointed out, I was actually supposed to be uh, your Sunday school teacher today. So here's your Sunday school lesson. 
It's on baptism. Well, what is baptism? Well, it's actually something we've been talking about a lot already today. I heard most, most of the message, but baptism about death and life. It's about a journey. Scripture connects this idea of baptism to even some stories in the Old Testament that we've been going through in our Sunday school curriculum. The stories of the flood, how one man, his family's faith, building this boat, uh, delivered them from the waters of judgment and death. Connects it to Moses and the Israelites with the Red Sea parting and them passing through it, through the waters of death into life by faith. But the greatest story that the Bible connects baptism with is the story of Jesus. God, the Son of God, God as a man who came down, lived a perfect life, and died for our sins. He didn't just pass through water. He passed through death itself for our sake. And if we believe in that, then we have eternal life because of what he accomplished for us on the cross. The price paid for our sin, the resurrection from the dead, and the invitation into the life that we can share with him. So yeah, with that, I'd like to invite Jill to come down. Just have two quick questions for her. So Jill... Have you put your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin and the hope of eternal life? Awesome. And is it your desire uh, through baptism to publicly declare that faith to everybody here? Yes. Awesome. Well, it's on the proclamation of your faith that I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, dead to sin and alive in Christ. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.